And sorry about that. I think that we all lost it, but glad to see you back. I will set up uh, the share screen. So I, I will start in in one minute. Is that within twelve or five to start? Um, so bear with me for a second. Okay, so welcome everyone to the seminar. Um, if if uh, I'm, I'm trying, by the way, a, a new setup, you, you'll see that you can see uh, the chat will, will show up in the recording, so uh, anything right there will, will be recorded there. And uh, besides the, the talk, I'm also looking forward to, to get feedback on the, on the layout and, and the, the platform, okay? So please uh, give me any thoughts about it. Okay, so uh, without further ado, I will just uh, start with the with the content of today's seminar. So I'm, I'm Nirli Povetsky. I'm part of the faculty here on in the in the School of Computer Information System. And today, the talk that I'm going to give is is about some work uh, that originated in classical planning that we've extended lately to 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 let's say. To, to work with tractable, tractable bounds, meaning that we, we can have polynomial algorithms to solve discrete sequential problems, as well as um, continuous problems. Okay? And this is a joint work with, uh, with Mikel Ramirez from the Electrical Engineering Department of School, um, and with uh, Airbus. Florent is at Airbus. He was very interested in one of the problems in continuous domains. And this uh, work has been led, uh, the one about discrete problems, it was led by ANU, and it was published in ICAPS, which is the main uh, planning conference, and each guy last year. Okay, so this is just to set, set up a little bit the, the context. Um, the motivation of, of, of planning, let's say, is that you could understand that planning 
is the model-based approach to control. Okay, so if you're familiar, I, I, I'm not sure what is the background of the audience today, so I'm, I'm gonna be a bit general and assume that you know everybody understands a little bit of CS or engineering uh, with an engineering background. So the way to describe model uh, planning, I would say, is the, is the area that known as the model-based approach to control. And what happens is that the research field is, is very fragmented, okay? So for once, there are many models. So whenever you're trying to solve a problem, you, you have to set up which are the assumptions uh, that specify your model. So you can have classical, MDP. So these, so these are all different varieties of models for those of you that are familiar with those, with these terms. Then there are different ways to specify the models. You can use languages, so formal languages, or you can use simulators. Okay, so imagine just a simulate a physical engine simulating some behavior. And the other thing is that there are different communities. Okay, so there is one which is the, the one that attends to ICAP slash triple I each kind, and the other one is the more neurosymbolic uh, community. Um, and the best way at the end of the day to, to get across ideas from different communities is to build among common benchmarks. Okay, so, so you'll see that part of the talk that I'm gonna give today um, taps into work that started in classical planning, but the algorithms are tested over benchmarks from other communities. So what is classical planning? Okay, so classical planning is the problem of finding a sequence of actions, so a path that maps one initial state to one of the goal states of the problem. Okay, so the best way to imagine it is that in, you, you should think that you have a huge graph, okay, so big that it's defined implicitly, meaning that you don't have the graph explicitly in your memory, you just uncover it while you search for a solution. And what you're trying to do is like a shortest path problem from the initial state to the goal, okay, to one of the possible goals. Now, as I said, the graph is encoded implicitly, and normally the way to encode it is through a compact logical representation in the, given by a standard description language known as PDDL, it's Planning Domain Description Language. In, in this case, what are the main components? Well, you have formulas, goal formulas, specifying which are the states that you're aiming to reach. Uh, then you have atoms or variables uh, that define all the possible states that you that your system can be in and then you have a full specification of the initial state okay and that's how you from these three components you can pretty much create that huge graph for which you have to find a path so the main approach to solve uh, such problems is to use um, heuristic search guided through heuristics that are derived automatically from the description of the problem okay from pdl so these heuristics instead of someone coming up with a heuristic function uh, this is extracted automatically then there are some inference techniques known as helpful actions landmarks that's beyond of the scope what i want to cover today and the main point is that huge problems are solved and no one even bothers to discuss the size of the state spaces anymore okay factorial it's all right we can we can try um now the way that we test the progress in, in the area is by looking at the different competitions and seeing how the the different landmark, uh, different landmark, sorry, different planners uh, uh, place within each other. Now, if we look at the theory, we know that classical planning is piece space complete. Okay, uh, some of you might might wonder, wait a minute, you just said that we're solving a shortest path problem, shortest path. Uh, it's not P space complete, but where the P space complete comes from is the size of the problem. Okay, so the size of the graph is what kicks in here to make this complexity result. So in a nutshell, classical planning should be extremely hard, but we can see that current planners solve most of the problems uh, in a few seconds. Okay, so the research that I'm going to introduce you now started with the following question. Can we explain why planners perform so well? And in fact, can we try to characterize which is the line that separates easy from hard problems? Okay. Um, the answer to that 
uh, was a new width notion, okay, and a new algorithm exponential in this width. A width, uh, you should think about it as a parameter, okay, a parameter that is used to characterize the complexity of a problem, and in fact, in this case, also the complexity of a certain algorithm. Now, the answer that we found is that the current domains have a small width, okay, when goals are restricted to single atoms, okay? When, when you read atoms, think about variables that can be true or false, okay? So when you have the goal being uh, the specification of achievement a single variable, generally the width of such problems are quite low. And when you have joint goals, so goal states that have multiple variables, where it's easy to achieve one variable at a time. Okay, and, and so that's pretty much the main insights that we had. If we want to synthesize hard problems, well, the best way to do so is either find problems that have high atomic width, so where you find a single variable that require, requires high width, but that's very hard to, to create. And in fact, in, in the ben current benchmarks, it's hard to find such cases. Otherwise, you can also think about problems, so the hardness of the problems coming from the fact that you have multiple state variables and that it's not easy to serialize them in to achieve just one at a time. Examples of such case, I mean, for those of you familiar with Sokoban, uh, this is one example where if you think only about one goal at a time, most likely you end up in a dead end, or other puzzles like a 15 puzzle. So if you think about sliding tiles, if you reason just at about one tile at a time, you would not be able to solve the problem. Okay, so that leads me to 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 the to the area of width-based planning, which is pretty much the the theory and the algorithms that took advantage of the insights explaining why problems are simple or hard. Okay, so today I'm gonna try a different approach. Generally, I just start with the definition, tell you about the algorithm. Today I'm gonna start with an example, uh, and then go to the more formal slides, let's say. Okay, so the simplest algorithm that we have is known as uh, iterative width, and it's a breadth-first search, okay? So remember, breadth-first search is an algorithm that always expands the shallowest, um, the shallowest nodes first, okay? So this is the order of expansion. Now, if you have this choice, it will expand the shallowest, okay? So breadth-first search. So it's a breadth first search that prunes states that are not novel, okay? And what, what does it mean, novel, okay? So, so let's say that we have here a grid. Um, this is our y axis, this is our x uh, axis. And basically we have two state variables. We have x and y. And we say that the novelty of a state, so every time that we have a state, we have to ask what is the novelty. We say that the novelty is one if either x or y have a value that we haven't seen so far in the search. Okay, so it's the first time that we see a certain value of x or y. If we have a state that, you know, both x individually and y individually, the values that they contain have been seen before, then we have to look at the pair, okay? Whether we've seen these two values together. If that's new for the first time in the search, we'd say that the novelty is two, okay? So in a way, we're looking for the smallest cardinality of variables that contain a valuable a value that is novel in our search so if let's say that the state doesn't contain any novel tuple uh, we just set it to the number of variables plus one okay so novelty three then let's say that we were prune non-novel states given a certain bound we can just for example expand only the novel one states or the novel two states and generally, let's say that we explore the first, first the lowest values of novelty. Okay, so that's that's the preference. So let me give you an example. Let's say that we go up here. Um, the novelty of this state is one. Why? Uh, well, basically, if you look at the at the y axis here, this is the first time that we see y equal one. Okay, so this value being the first time that we've seen, let us. Uh, to this statement, that we see an individual value in the state, which is true for the first time. Okay, so if we go up again, well, it's the first time that we see y equals two, right? So this value is the first time that we see it. Let's say that we go right now. 
what will be our expected novelty. So um, if we go right, our novelty should be one, right? Because basically it's the first time that we see x equal one. So this axis is the first time that we explore it. So we continue the search and now the question would be this state, okay? So what happened if we move to this state? Thank you, Abby. So what happened if we move to this state? Will we have novelty one, novelty two? What will be the novelty of this state? Two, perfect. Uh, why? Can you help me untangling why would be the novelty two? Hmm. Perfect. Both X and Y are new values. Okay, correct. So, so to, to be more specific, even I mean the, what happens is that X equal uh, so basically we have the value of X equal one, right? So if I look at X equal one, to be able to say that has a multi one, I have to say that X equal one, for example, is the first time I've seen it, and that's not true because we've seen it here. Right, so let's look at y equal three. Y equal three. Is it the first time that we've seen it? No, it's not true. We've seen it before over here. Okay, so basically there's no way that you can have novelty one. The only novelty is seeing these two values together. Okay, so seeing um, seeing one, three together, that's the first time that we can we can say that uh, we see these two values together, and that's why we have novelty two. Good, so I'm uh, glad to see that the, the ideas uh, are clear. The search will continue in this fashion and it will stop at this point without finding a solution, by the way. So if you're trying to go from here to here, it won't be able, and if it only expands nodes with novelty one. If you expand nodes with novelty two as well, then uh, we'll be able to find a solution. And in fact, we'll be able to correlate this with some of the theory stating that the, the width of this problem is two. Okay, so let me now be a bit more formal, trying to basically state what it is that you've seen in the example before. So the novelty of a state is the following. We say that a state generates a new tuple of atoms, okay, so remember a new tuple of variables in the search. If it's the first state that generated made that tuple true in the search, okay? Um, a state might general generate multiple tuples, okay? So it might have multiple tuples that are first, that are true for the first time in the search. The novelty is defined in terms of the smallest new tuple generated by the state. If no such tuple exists, as I said before, you said the, um, the novelty to n plus one, where n is the number of variables. Okay, so, so we'll just rephrase it one more time. The novelty of a state is the smallest tuple of atoms that are true in the state and false in all the states seen previously in the search. Okay, and this is the example that we showed before. Novelty state, novelty one means a single variable valuation that is true for the first time. If no such valuation exists, we look at pairs and so on and so forth in terms of the number of variables that we have. Okay. If there is any question, please feel free, feel free to stop me uh, at any point, okay? No, no need to wait until the end of, of the seminar. So the main algorithm that we have here, um, and I showed before in the example, it's called bounded iterative width. It's a breadth first search that prunes newly generated states whose novelty is greater than the bound, okay? And iterative width is nothing else than a sequence of calls through increasing bounds, okay, so we keep increasing the bound until the problem is solved or the bound exceeds the number of variables. Uh, at that point, the number of variables, if you exceed the number of variables, basically you won't be doing any pruning, uh, you will be just doing breadth first search. Okay, so that's, that's the intuition why you stop once you extend the number of variables. Uh -huh. Okay, so what is the main property of this algorithm? Well, the main property is that bounded iterative width 
expands at most a bounded number of states. Okay, and, and that bound is given by the number of variables exponential to the bound that you use. Now, let, let's think for a minute, why is this the case? Okay, so imagine that I have n, n Boolean variables, okay, n Boolean variables. How many states can we have in our search that have novelty one? Okay, so basically, how many states can we have in this in the search that add add at least uh, one new variable? Uh, the answer is basically n. Okay, so if we have n objects, well. At most, we're gonna see n different states, each with a single object, okay? And this is exponential in the size of the tuples that we wish to consider, okay? So basically, this is the worst case of novelty two. So it's a quadratic algorithm or a linear algorithm if we use novelty one, okay? So um, how good this algorithm works actually in classical planning, well, while being blind and simple, okay, so it doesn't have anything goal-oriented, so it just looked at the novelty, this algorithm is quite good for single atoms, okay, for goals with single atoms. Remember, single atoms means goals that are specified with a single uh, goal variable. Now, this is not an accident because, as I mentioned before, the, the, the benchmarks tend to have small width for single goals, single goal atoms. And what we did actually to test this experimentally is we chose, we took all the benchmarks that we had in the international planning competitions and we created for every problem with n goals, we created n problems with a single goal. Okay, and that created a pool of almost uh, 38,000 problems from which here you have the coverage. Okay, so how many problems were solved? Uh, in the middle, you have blind search algorithms. Okay, this is iterative deepening, um, breadth first search. And you can see that remarkably, the only difference between IW and breadth first search is that one uses novelty and the other doesn't. Okay, so IW and, Bre and breadth first search are quite similar. The only difference is the novelty pruning. And you can see that just by doing novelty pruning, the coverage jumps a lot. Okay, in fact, it jumps so much that is comparable with a heuristic search algorithm. Okay, and generally heuristic search algorithm are much better just be because they have a heuristic function that is looking at the goal. Okay, so it makes the search to be or goal oriented. Okay, so it's quite remarkable that by not looking at the goal, but instead looking at the novelty of the state, so looking rather at the past, you actually manage to have quite a robust algorithm. So if I need to explain you why this is the case, I need to introduce you the, to the structure, okay, so uh, the combinatorial structure that defines the width of the problem, okay, so this next two slides, this one and the next one, are really abstract, but I'll do my best to get the intuition across, at least the intuition, but feel free to, to ask any question about this. So this is the notion of width, okay, so we, let's say that this, this lake, is your, your graph, your, your state space. Um, this side of the shore is the initial state. This side of the shore is the goal state. And, and now what you're looking for is a special structure, which is this trail of stepping stones, okay? And this trail of stepping stones needs to have certain properties, okay? So what are the properties? Well, each stepping stone uh, needs to be made out of k variables, okay? So k is a bound that you're giving. So you're saying, look, I'm not gonna use more than k values in each of the stepping stone, okay? So value, so each variable. So each stepping stone, the size of the stepping stone is bounded by k. Now, once you have the bound on the size of, of your stepping stone, the next constraint is that the distance between each of the stepping stones is one, okay? So with a single action, you can go from one stepping stone into the next one. 
And the last constraint is that there is no way that you can achieve any of the stepping stones with a shortest path that doesn't follow the actual trail, okay? So there is no way to find another trail leading to any of the stepping stones that has a shortest path, okay? So basically the trail of stepping stones preserves optimality, okay? So these are the three notions. Now, what does this have to do with, uh, with the notion of width, okay? So the notion of width tells you the following. If you find such a trail of stepping stones, you have to look at your biggest stone, okay? So this is size K, and this will be exactly the width of the problem, okay? So the way to think about it is that, let's say I throw to you a domain, um, and I ask you, please, you need to prove which is the width of this problem. Well, in order to do so, you have to analytically find, you know, this trail of stepping stones. So you would start and say, let's try to find it uh, if there exists a trail of stepping stones with uh, k equal one. If you cannot find it, well, you have to prove that it doesn't exist, and then you will try to find it with k equal two. If you manage to find this trail of stepping stones, then you can be assured of certain properties with respect to IW, okay? Another way to look at it is that this trail of stepping stones, um, you can think about it as a constraint. You impose that the only paths that your search will consider are the paths compliant with states that entail are entailed by these uh, stepping stones, which are basically tuples of a bounded size. Okay, this is a bit abstract, I know, uh, but I, I just hope that at least a little bit of the intuition of what it is that is being exploited by the width algorithms um, is, is, is conveyed, okay? Now, there are interesting properties that you can say about IW. If you know the width of the problem, you can use this as a bound, and you have a bound on the, on the complexity of the algorithm, and you know that this algorithm will solve the problem optimally, okay? So it's an important result. And in fact, um, managed to prove analytically that many planning domains have a bounded width of two. So I found a trail of stepping stones of size two, uh, independent of the initial situation and the size of the problem, okay? Provided that the goals are single atoms, okay? What does it mean? Well, it has a big implication because it means that regardless of the size of the problem or the initial situation, these problems can be solved in quadratic time. Instead of, you know, P-space completeness, which, which is a much worse uh, uh, guarantee of, of complexity, okay? So, so this is quite an important result. And in fact, if you want to, to prove other domains, well, you need to just find this trail of stepping stones and you can rest assured that you will know the complexity of your problem. Now, what's the elephant in the room, okay? So the elephant in the room, I would say that I'm all the time talking about problems whose, let's say, goal variables are just one. Well, if you have uh, problems with more than one goal variable, the width wow. jumps up, okay? So, so in this case, uh, what we did in the past was to, um, was to, to create an, a new algorithm called best first with search, which combines ideas from novelty and ideas from best for search and heuristic search. And, and this manages basically to lower the width of solving the problems, okay? Uh, for those of you that are familiar with best for search, basically we use a priority queue where the evaluation function prefers always novel states first and then break ties with some heuristics, okay? Which are goal oriented. So in a way managing to, to balance exploration and exploitation. Now, the only problem there is that computing novelty for values greater than two is generally quite expensive, okay? Uh, quite expensive, meaning that it's, it's quadratic. And if you want to spend a quadratic computation in every state, well, most likely uh, novelty will bite you, meaning that the search will be too slow, okay? In fact, uh, we know that uh, if we want to compute, for example, novelty two, okay, so we need a quadratic amount of memory. Uh, why? Well, 
basically because we need to keep a table of all the tuples that we've seen so far, true, false, true, and this will tell us whether we've seen a certain tuple, you know, x, y, so before we saw the example, so 0, 0, 0, 1, etc., until n, n, okay, where n is the number of, of rows or columns in a, in a grid. Okay, so the amount of memory that we need to keep um, is quadratic, okay, this is one issue, especially when you have, you know, problems with 10,000, 100,000 fluence, well, quadratic number of, 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 big, of bits, uh, you, you cannot run it always. Okay, so this is one of the issues. The other one is that in order to compute the novelty, you have to enumerate all the tuples in the state. And in the worst case, you will have, well, n to the i, where i is the bound, okay? So if we're computing novelty two, you're gonna have to enumerate a quadratic number of tuples. So again, 100,000 tuples, uh, if you do the quadratic of that, uh, you are very much uh, in a realm where your, your search will be too slow. Okay, so the questions that we tried to answer in 2021 with, uh, with Anu, uh, was whether we could find approximations of novelty that require linear time and memory, okay? And, and if we do so, whether this would be actually helpful for, for the search, okay? So the other question that we had is, well, let's say, let's assume that we can find linear approximations. Are these linear approximations going to be an upper bound or a lower bound? And when are they going to agree with the actual novelty? of the search, uh, of, the, of the state, sorry. Okay, and in a way, if there is gonna be an error, is this error going to improve the performance or is going to make the planners worse? Okay, so these are the three questions that we tackled in the papers in, in ICAPS 2021 that is about novelty approximation. Okay, so in, in the next few slides, I'm not going to give, let's say, two, many technical um, technical ideas, but I'm going to go to, uh, I think, uh, enough depth to give you the intuitions of, of how we manage to, to, to deal with the complexity of computing novelty for every state. Okay, so the first, the first thing that I want to show you is how did we tackle the issue of uh, exponential time, okay, exponential time in the, in the novelty, in the maximum novelty that we want to compute. So, um let's assume okay that this beta i refers to all the tuples of size i in a given state okay so basically beta i is the set of tuples of a given size i in a given state okay basically where we know that in the worst case we're gonna have if the state var if the state contains all the variables of the problem well then we're gonna have n to the i tuples okay so What's the main idea? Okay, so the main idea is that we want to bring this complexity down. The exponential, we want to make it disappear. The simplest approach that we could do is, is to use ideas from sampling. Okay, so we did the following three steps. Okay, so the first, uh, instead of using the full set bi, which we know that in the worst case is exponential, what we did instead is we sample a smaller size, actually, we want to sample a linear size where the growth rate is dictated by the i, but instead of being exponential, is linear from the maximum novelty that you want to compute. Okay, so first thing is that this is i n instead of being n to the i. Okay, so we sample a subset which is linear. Uh, then the next question is well, how do you sample, right? So there are many ways to, to sample uh, elements from a given set. Well, we just did the most naive uh, sampling. We just did uniform distribution. Uh, you could do different things. We didn't explore that, okay? So we say, let's keep it simple. Also, because then we wanted to prove some results in terms of the probability of error. And that was basically a simple way to do that. Okay, so first you sample a linear amount of tuples following a uniform distribution. And then instead of computing novelty with respect to the full set of BI, well, we compute novelty only with respect to the tuples that we sampled. Okay, so basically instead of sampling 
computer novelty with respect to n to the i tuples, you compute it with respect to i to the n, i times n. Now, something that I need to tell you about the way that we sample, okay, there's two ways to sample. There's one that is called sampling with replacement and then sampling without replacement. Okay, so when, in, in this picture, what you see in the, in the left hand side, so you see that here we have, for example, beta, this is beta, beta i s. So this is all the tuples in a given state. Every round, every ball here is a tuple. Now, if you sam sample with replacement, it means that you can see a tuple more than once, okay? Uh, this is not what we wanted. So instead we did sampling without replacement, which means that every time that you sample, every time that you sample, uh, a tuple and it gets chosen, this tuple disappears from your set, making sure that you, you will not choose it again. Okay, so this is it in terms of taming the complexity in terms of um, computation time. Okay, so basically we use sampling techniques. Now, in terms of memory, okay, so how do you, did we manage to get the exponential time memory into something that is manageable? Well, we use a concept which is called Bloom filters. It's a data structure, a probabilistic data structure, actually, uh, that has the following um, the following ideas. Okay, so for the time being, let's forget about this part. Okay, let's focus only on the left hand side of the slide. So generally, you should think about a Bloom filter as a bit vector. Okay, so literally a vector made of bits, which can be set to one or zero. And that bit vector has a certain constant size. Okay, the size is given by a parameter. Okay, in fact, you have three parameters, uh, two that are stated here, and the third one I will tell you now in a little bit. Now, what's interesting about Bloom filters is that it's like, a, for those of you that are familiar with hash tables, it's like a hash table, but it has a fixed size, m, and you use k hash functions. Okay, instead of using one, use k. Now, what I want to show you in this picture over here is how do you add an item? Okay, so let's say that I have a tuple which is made only of the fluent p. So if I need to add the tuple to the table saying, look, I've seen this tuple, well, I will use each of my, my hash functions. Okay, so let's say that I have three hash functions. Well, I will use H1, I will set this to one. I'll do the same with H2, I will set this to one, same with the last one, and I will set it to one. Okay, now I get another tuple, and I will use the same hash function. Even if this was set to one, okay, already, I mean, I will just make sure that it's set to one again. So there might be collisions, that's fine. And I will do the same with all the hash functions. Now, this is about adding, okay? I see a new tuple, I sample a new tuple, this is how I add it to my table. Now, if I want to check, okay? So let's say that now I want to check novelty and I, I have a new tuple and I want, before adding it to the table, I want to check whether this tuple is new, is novel. So how, how are we gonna do it? Well, you just have to use all your hash functions and as soon as you find a zero entry, it means that this tuple is novel. Okay, so let's say we use H3. Well, we have a one. I cannot use H3 to say that it's novel. I use H2, I have one, cannot use H H2. Instead, if I use H1, I find a zero hit, and that means that R hasn't been seen before. Okay, so basically you use more than one hash functions, and as soon as you have a zero, you can say that this tuple is novel. Now, you can see here that with a certain probability, you're going to have errors, okay? So what is the probability of error in a, in a Bloom filter? Well, the probability of error that the, that the Bloom filter tells me that the tuple is novel is actually zero, okay? If I find a zero, I'm 100% sure that this is actually true, okay? Now, the probability of error comes uh, when when I have collisions, okay? When the Bloom film, full filter tells me that the tuple is not novel. Let's assume now, for the sake of the argument, that we didn't have H1, okay? So this didn't exist. 
Okay, so let me erase all this. So this is zero. This didn't exist either. This will remain one, and this didn't exist either. Okay, so this remains zero. In that case, you can clearly see that R is novel, but uh, both the heats of H3 and H2 are one. Okay, so it will actually tell me that this table is not novel and this is an error. Okay, now there are results that show you actually analytically how you can, what is the bound on the, on the error that you have. The bound is, is expressed with this um, equation where K is the number of hash functions that you have, N is the number of elements, in our case is the number of tuples, and M is the size of your Bloom filter. And in fact, there is also an analytic solution that tells you how to minimize this error if you know M and N, okay? So it tells you what's the value of K that you have to, to, to choose, if you know what is the maximum amount of memory that you are willing to sacrifice, and you know how many elements you're gonna see. Okay, and in fact, for our case, the, the best K to choose was one, okay? Just use one hash functions. And just because the num this is because the number of elements is much, much bigger than the, the size of the global filter. Now, good, the, the good thing is that if, if you want to see what happened in terms of proofs, uh, we proved analytically and experimentally what's the probability of error in terms of approximating the novelty. This can be found in the paper uh, in ICAPS by Anu. Um, we also introduced an idea about open list control, which I won't give much details, but the, the, the idea now is that suddenly we can compute novelty values which are much greater than two, which before we couldn't, uh, just the complexity uh, didn't allow us. But now the problem is that all our algorithms are designed in a way that they always give priority to, to novel, the smallest novel values, and we don't have much chance to explore the, the states with higher novelties. Okay, so we designed a measure to control the growth of each of the novelty categories um, by, by saying which states can go into the open list or not. Okay, not giving more details, but you can find it in the paper. Uh, the great outcome is that now we can solve problems with high width, even if they have multiple atomic goals, and we can do it even with algorithms that are polynomial. Okay, remember that IW or BFWS prune novels, non-novel states, so we can have polynomial bounds. And this is the only, let's say, experimental result I'm going to show you in about about this this piece of work. In the right, in the in this. Y axis, you can see it covers, which means the number of problems solved given a, a benchmark. Um, and this is the runtime, okay? So the time that it took. This is the polynomial version. I know that it's a terrible name, uh, but the red line is the polynomial approximation algorithm. The rest of the algorithms are, um, are other state of the art algorithms. Let me put it that, that way. And you can see clearly that there is a gap Okay, in us. so we not only manage to have a polynomial planner, but we can also manage to solve more problems than other planners that are actually exponential, meaning that they don't have any guarantee on their performance. Okay, so that was a, a positive result uh, that we took from this line of research. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what happens if you have continuous domains. Okay, so we'll take the next 10 minutes to, to explain this idea. Now, we know that you know, novelty grades well, works well because you manage to prune lots of states even uh, if the dimensionality of the problem is quite high. Okay, so when I talk about dimensionality, it means that the number of variables is quite big. Um, the other good thing is that it can work either with a model uh, or with a simulator. So many of the planners in, you know, that you can use in planning, they can only work if you have a declarative representation of the problem. For us, we just need the state variables, that's all. We, and these can be specified through a simulator. So the transition function, function can be specified both ways. And it's very easy to implement, okay? As long as you have state features, okay? State features, the same as state variables. So long as you have state variables, well, uh, you can use novelty. That's the only requirement that we have. But so far, I'm always talking about discrete variables, right? Before I tell you true, false, in the grid, I was saying, saying one, two, three, four. So there are always discrete variables. Now, what happened if you need to reason about continuous state variables, so real numbers? Uh, 
Well, uh, we did some work with, uh, with uh, Lyndon, uh, Mikhail, uh, and, and a few other colleagues that are in the school, where we used the simplest possible approach. Okay? The simplest possible approach, which was to take every state variable, which has, was a real number, and we converted it into a bit vector. And we use this representation as the state features of the problem. And as long as we found a bit which wasn't seen before, well, the state was novel. Okay, so that was a straightforward translation into something that we knew that worked, which is the discrete representation. Okay, so this was our state representation. Now, it worked well for uh, creating maneuvers over UAVs. Okay, so it's a high dimensionality problem, quite complex. But uh, something that we looked at with, uh, with colleagues at Airbus uh, is domains where actually this didn't work so well. Okay, and the main reason why is because you are losing, in this representation, you are losing the meaning of, of the values here. Okay, um, so you lose the structure of the state space, it's gone for you. Okay, so, so what I'm going to introduce now is that, well, you could do fixed discretizations, but it's known that uh, this is very finicky because it really de depends on the dynamics of the problem. If you have certain object that moves too fast or too slow, well, you need different discretizations. Okay, so discretization is, is not the way to go, like fixed discretization, sorry. So um, this is a classic example uh, of classic control problems. Uh, this is mountain car, okay? You, you can control the acceleration, you can go left or right, okay? And you just basically can put certain acceleration into each of those directions. The idea is that you want to move left, right, left, right, until you can manage to go into this position. Uh, on the right hand side, we have uh, a different example. This is the card pole. The, the idea is that you can move left and right, and you want to maintain this pole uh, in an upward position. You, you want to avoid uh, this pole to fall on the ground, okay? So generally, when you look at the literature, some, some of these problems can, uh, can, uh, can accept uh, say analytic solutions that you can solve uh, as an optimization problem, but most of the bins, let's say, algorithms that have been tried lately are algorithms that require learning, training, okay? So take PPO, uh, or BQN, etc. Okay, so what we showed here is that, well, you can use actually IW. The only thing that you need is that you have to think about how you encode the features of your states. Okay, so in this paper, what we introduced was a concept of um, B features. B stands for boundary extension encoding, which basically uh, you know, takes your continuous variables and create and state features for you. Okay, so let me give you the example that we had before. Now you notice that we have the grid, and the grid disappeared, okay? And what we have instead is a continuous control problem. You have, you can control the speed either in either direction, X or Y, and the speed follows uh, the, the next constraint. You are not going to be able to move faster than 0 0.5, okay? So it's clipped at 0 0.5. And the closer you are at the center, okay, so this is the center is 2.5, okay, 2.5. The closer you are to the center, uh, the slower you're gonna go, okay? So that's, that's the way that we specify this problem in the sake of this example. Cool, okay, so this is the problem, grid disappeared. How are you going to compute novelty here? Well, we're gonna do the following. Each variable has a domain, right? You can, you can, you can draw a line and you can see which are, let's say, the boundaries of the domain that you've seen so far. Okay, and we're gonna, every time that we manage to exchange, extend the boundary, we're gonna assign it a new ID and we're gonna do, use that encoding as a state variable. So in a way, the search will drive the discretization. Okay, that's why we are saying that this is a dynamic discretization. Okay, so I won't have much time to go into details, but let's just let me show you one thing. Okay, so here we have the domain of X, we have the domain of Y. If we go up, what happens? Well, it happens that we extended the domain of Y, and this is an interval that is the first time that we've seen it. So what we're gonna use is the ID for this interval, and instead of using 0 0.5 and, and 2.5, we're gonna use instead the intervals 
upon this upon which these values fall okay so this is zero one and this is going to be my state encoding i go right again i create this interval i go up i create this new interval so now it's one two i go down in the x in the y axis and and i can see that this is two so the encoding is one for y this is one this state will have novelty two and in fact if you see the way that the search works it's quite similar to how the discrete version worked okay so the, we have the same shape that this is what novelty one will look at and if we have novelty two we can find the solution okay this is quite fast uh, just running out of time so i will just show you a little bit the results that we have okay these are hard problems by the way there's plenty of states that you could find um and what happened is that when we tested it over mountain car and an acrobot in the in this this line orange line you can see the time that it took to the width based algorithm to find the optimal solution here whereas on the blue, on blue you can see that ppo after 600 seconds doesn't manage to find a similar solution in the acrobot which you're trying to put this all the way up uh, again bfws was much faster and it took 100 seconds for ppo to reach on average a solution with similar quality same results hold for card poll you can see that ppo takes much longer and we also try some anytime planners and we can see that they managed to improve beyond the performance of ppo uh, under different initial conditions we also tried real time what would happen if we have real time behavior so this is the bound of the number of of, of, of the time allowed for each of our algorithms to to find a solution and we can see that we can achieve real time performance uh, with good results okay why did airbus get involved in this well they were interested in a taxing problem what is taxing you have an airplane and you have to basically steer it to go into the place where it has to sit in the airport now this is a complex uh, domain state continuous 10 continuous state variables we use a version that has only one action which is steering the rest is automatic and there are very long horizons okay now our algorithms didn't cut it through the main reason why is the engine physics engine is extremely extremely expensive okay so computing the next state is way too expensive so here there is further research that needs to be done because we need algorithms that actually expands very few states because every state has a huge computational cost okay so with that i want to leave it here the main take-home message that i would like you to to remember at least if, if, from any of those concepts is that when you think about your data structures or your algorithms you always think about trade-offs with memory and time okay but i encourage you think about probabilistic i would not say correctness sometimes i mean because here what we sacrifice is the correctness of the novelty value but the solutions are still correct okay so sometimes you can have let's say functions that guide your search that are not absolutely correct but it might give you an advantage in terms of memory and time okay and that you can tap into that okay so if you have a problem that you're suffering with memory and time think about probabilistic data structures and if you are dealing with control problems stop training stop learning no, i'm kidding you have an alternative at least that works quite well and it's worth trying okay and and this work uh, has been presented in each guy uh, last week uh, and and there is a, a paper with the same title that does a, basically a review of the field of width-based planning and also i state some common let's say well, some some work that has been done by other other people and open challenges okay or research directions that i think that are interesting to explore okay with that i leave it here thank you everyone for your attention so if if you have any question uh please uh, feel free to unmute yourself Okay, I think it's worth putting real claps. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I'll stop the claps. Um, okay, good. So anyone, any any comment, question, feel free to drop it in the in the chat. Um, or just ask it. Cool. So if there's no more questions, or any, well, no questions, uh, 
thank you all for attending. I hope that everybody is safe, well, and, and I hope to see you on campus soon. Thanks, Neil. Great talk. Easy. Thank you, Lyndon. Stay well. Actually, while you're here, Neil,